G'day guys and welcome to episode 3 of Fix It Fingers Fibers. Today I've got wood. I've got a lot of wood and I want to share my wood with you. Just like before, the first two episodes we covered power tools and hand tools for the beginning woodworker, but they're pretty useless if you don't have any material to woodwork. And we're going to be looking at big box stuff. There are going to be no surprises today. Effectively, what I'd like to cover are the different wood and wood based products that a beginner is going to see when they walk into that shop, what those products can and can't be used for, and the relative cost thereof. Do hang around because after I finish showing you my wood, at the end, I'm going to show you how you can get my wood for free in a lot of circumstances. But let's go with the paid stuff first. On my left, let's kick it off with the bog standard building material for just about everyone starting their woodworking career, and that is pine. It is really cheap. It is widely available in all sorts of sizes and dimensions. In fact, this is usually called dimensional lumber if you're overseas, or dimensional timber. And there are two main varieties I want to discuss. This one here that looks all clean and shiny is called DAR, or Dressed All Round, otherwise known overseas occasionally as Surfaced Four Sides, S4S. And there are so many different shapes and sizes that you can build huge numbers of woodworking projects just with these things. In fact, I have done so on several occasions. This here, a piece of treated pine. Treated pine is used with chemicals to make it more weather resistant, and you'll see it in the construction industry. It will usually be marked with what that treatment is. I'm not gonna go into those today, but we'll have a quick look at that too in a second. So your standard dimensional pine, it is great for just about anything. It's incredibly multi-purpose in its uses, except for, of course, outside work, unless you're gonna put some paint on there. It is very soft, is one of its disadvantages, but for a beginner, this is handy because it's much easier to tool and machine. Cutting it, planing it, sanding it, all of those tasks are going to be very, very easy. And if you do bugger up something, fixing it can be quite simple too. So the vast majority of us are going to start building things out of pine. Cheap, available, and very, very flexible. Your construction grade or treated pine is what you want to look at if you're building outside projects. Again, you can paint and stain it as well to get different colors and to get it some greater life, but don't use it for inside stuff and definitely don't use it for firewood. It releases toxic chemicals. Do your research if you are going to be building a specifically outside project because as I said, there are different types of treatment designed for different applications. If you're going to put it in the ground, if you've got termites as a problem in your area, all of those sorts of things too. But just like its clean indoor brother, it is cheap, it is widely available and comes in really long lengths for construction, funnily enough doesn't mean you can't use it inside on your workshop projects if you like, so it is really nice and long and strong, but I avoid this unless it really calls for it in the project. So your long skinny bits of pine are going to be great for making frames, making boxes. You can edge join them together to make panels, but because it is so soft, generally you may not be looking at that. There are better products which we'll go to right now. So in the workshop, whenever you want something large and flat, you're probably not going to stick a bunch of pine together. You're probably going to reach for plywood. It comes in a variety of qualities, but all of it in Australia is going to be rather expensive. Even the cheap grade construction ply can cost a lot of dollars. It goes right through to things like Baltic birch and veneered walnut ply, and you're talking hundreds of dollars a sheet. Now, what do I mean by a sheet? This is obviously a rather small piece. Most plywood is gonna come in four by eight feet, but the Americans call it, or 1.2 by 2.4-ish meters. This can be quite tricky for the average DIYer to get home in their car. So fortunately, you can also get things called project panels, which are gonna be half or quarter sheets, or the store will sometimes cut it down for you, or my preferred technique is to grab yourself one of these, a Craig Rip Cut, and you can break down the ply to its rough dimensions in the car park. This thing has paid for itself five, 10 times over already, and I've only had it for about a year. Because obviously, buying the full sheets is a lot more economic than buying the smaller project panels. How do you tell the quality? Well, you can look at the surface, the starters, and you'll quickly see the construction grade versus the slightly nicer faces. Count the plies. This one only has 
three plies in it. I know it's thin, but that's a really cheap grade of plywood. This one has seven. So at 19 millimeters, that's probably what I would call pretty much standard. And then here's a slightly nicer one that comes from Bunnings. It's also seven, still 12 mil, just like the first one I showed you. Much, much nicer. This is veneered in Tasmanian oak. It's called marine ply. It's the premium plywood that you can easily access without going to a specialist supplier. So your common uses of plywood, making jigs, workshop cabinets, pretty much any time you need a large, flat, relatively thin area, it's going to be your go-to wood to begin with. In a similar vein of manufactured wood goods, next we have the DIY's best friend, MDF, medium density fiberboard. It has the advantage over ply of being a truckload cheaper. However, it is rather brittle. The dust that comes off it is quite toxic, so you need to make sure you've really got your mask on when you're doing anything with this stuff because it is just sawdust and glue effectively. But it does come in a wide variety of thicknesses and you get all your moldings and different things too. That'll give you a clue what it's good for. Just like ply, it's gonna do your large surface areas. The bottom of these cabinets are made out of MDF, but it's very, very heavy. Sometimes you can use this to your advantage. That's an 18 mil MDF product there. And when I built my dust cart, I used this on purpose for the bottom to use that weight to my advantage. But the real strength I find of MDF is how you can mold it. See the profile on there? This is this exact 18 mil MDF. Routing it is a dream. It will do exactly what you tell it to. Your tools will cut through it like butter. And as we said, because it's so cheap, you can use it in a lot of applications as long as you're conscious of how heavy they're gonna get. Apart from the weight, the main disadvantage of MDF is that it's ugly as sin and it doesn't like moisture. These ends also not very strong. So on my bench here, for instance, where I'm using MDF for the top, I'm gonna to have to band it. You can already see perhaps this one here, just from sitting on the floor, is fraying slightly. MDF is the DIYer's best friend because of its low cost and its versatility. It can't do all things, and some people just hate it and will avoid it like the plague. But let's be realistic here. On a budget, you're gonna find a truckload of uses for this stuff. Next up is another sheet good which I don't use terribly often. My mate Dave Stanton, though he loves it, his whole workshop is made out of melamine, otherwise known as chipboard covered in plastic. You'll see here it is just glue and wood chips. The coating is usually relatively tough, nice and flat, can be quite heavy as well, though that tends to vary rather a lot, and is absolutely perfect for knockdown furniture and again, cabinets. Go into your house and the vast majority of the cheaper furniture, your Ikea type stuff, and the internals of things like wardrobes and laundry cupboards, they're all going to be melamine. And that's what it's used for. I can't really think of too many uses in the workshop beyond that. You will notice though as well, not all melamine is chipboard. This here is actually a laminated piece of MDF. I'm using it for the bench top because it is super smooth and that's gonna make cleaning things up really easy. You also, can get melamine coated plywood. So melamine generally is going to more refer to the plastic coat than what is inside. Almost exclusively used for cabinetry, it also has the advantage of being very, very cheap. Just be watchful though, because gluing up melamine can be slightly difficult, though it does like pocket hole joinery. The two work well together. Last and certainly not least is where a lot of people will choose to start hardwood. Now, you could spend hours and write books on the topic of just Australian hardwoods, let alone looking around the world. However, we're going to quickly cover off some of the very common ones that in Australia on the East Coast, it's incredibly geographic what's available to you, you're going to see when you walk in your big box store. If you're not on the East Coast like me, then this will vary. However, it's going to have the same sort of pluses, minuses and uses. The colour and looks just going to be slightly different. Hardwood in Australia costs a fortune, and I mean a fortune. If you go onto YouTube as a novice, you're gonna see walnut, walnut, maple, cherry, walnut, maple, walnut, walnut, some more walnut, a little bit of maple, and then some birch and some walnut. None of those are available in Australia. Well, they are, but you're gonna to have to sell your left kidney in order to get your hands on one. Left. 
In Australia, we have beautiful wood species. They are absolutely gorgeous. They're still gonna cost you a bit, not as much as the imported American stuff. It can do everything. Everything that you've seen with these other manufactured and softwood products, hardwood can do, is just for you, it's gonna be harder to do it. Particularly if you take on the Australian timbers. They are notorious for destroying the blades on your tools because they are so dense, they have enough high silica contents and they will blunt things, chisels and planes particularly, very quickly, but even your power tool blades are gonna comp a battering. The three I have in front of me are the ones that I first saw when I walked into my Bunnings. They are Merbau or Merbu Decking. I recently made a gate for my brother for his dog and that's pretty much the best thing for this stuff because it leaches tannins like no tomorrow Outdoor projects is what it's designed for. Funnily enough, it's a decking material. It can have a range of colors, but it's quite a lovely dark reddish tone, and it is one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest hardwood you'll be able to get your hands on, and could be good for a beginner to use. Just be aware, incredibly brittle. This one is called Maranti. It is wonderful because it is very soft for a hardwood. It's just as workable as pine, so it's not too difficult to get into. It is also relatively inexpensive. Main disadvantage to pine is it doesn't come in as many shapes and sizes, but you will get a little bit of variety if you do look around. So moldings, trim, that kind of thing is what I've used Maranti for in the past. It is not as durable though as your tougher Australian woods. Then we go to everyone's darling, which is known as Vic Ash or Tasmanian Oak. If I had to say, at least on the East Coast, your bog standard Australian hardwood that you're going to see in furniture making and more finer woodworking projects, then Tassie Oak is the one you're going to get. Medium in cost, it's going to be a lot more expensive than your softwoods, obviously, but compared to some of your more exotic hardwoods, it will be your most affordable option. It again comes in a wide variety of ranges and sizes. You can edge joint it like I have done here. And you can make an awful lot of things out of it. So this is where you get into tabletops and your real furniture making where hardwood really shines because the grain and the colours, all of those things are going to work to your advantage. But it's a steep learning curve. A lot of people just jump straight into hardwoods and there's nothing wrong with that. But as a beginner, you might want to build up to using them, experiment and learn what the differences of working with something like this compared to working with this is before you start trying to build that Queen Anne sign table. The last thing on hardwoods I want to introduce are these things. These are also called project panels, but they have a big difference to the plywood ones in that they are solid Australian hardwoods and sometimes imported too. These have only recently, in the past few years, come online at Bunnings, and again, they're going to vary in availability with your geography, but they're a game changer. Cheating, probably a little bit. You no, know, traditionally woodworking, you're gonna mill up and edge joint these bits of timber yourself, but for me, they save so much time, they are relatively inexpensive. In fact, sometimes they're cheaper than the bloody plywood, and they look a hell of a lot better, in my opinion. The variety available for shelving, bench tops, sides of furniture. In fact, Paul Jenkins, the wood knight, made an entire series of Tassie oak stuff for his mum, made almost exclusively out of these panels, laminating them together to make the thicker leg stocks. I do recommend you go and check that out to see how schmick and professional the finished product of these can be. I would struggle to make a board as flat and as even as this. I just can't rave on about how much of a game changer these things are. So do check them out. You might outgrow them eventually, but starting off, hard to go bloody wrong. All right, guys, apologies, a bit of a rambly one here today, but I hope you enjoyed me showing off my wood and that you took something from it. If you found it educational, please consider subscribing to the channel as I'll have more Fix-It Fingers fibres, two left in this beginner's series, and of course my regular DIY and woodworking projects. If you'd like to hang around for a few minutes longer though, I'm going to clear the table of this store-bought stuff and replace it with stuff that I paid this much for to help us overcome that barrier of Australian wood being bloody expensive. Okie dokes, still here? Congratulations, you're a tight ass. That's a good thing, so am I. In Australia, we have this lovely word which you've probably heard me say a few times, scabbing. Scabbing basically means acquiring for free something that you probably shouldn't have, but you get away with it because nobody cares. Usually referring to with chips and cigarettes, today, 
we're of course talking a bit more about the wood. Pine is going to be fairly easy to get your hands on. In fact, I've just built my entire hectic half lap miter station out of bed slats. And bed slats are now my go-to free wood. You can find them on Gumtree and Facebook Marketplace, or if you just drive around during council hard collections or in my area whenever people dump stuff, the number of times you will see conveniently pre-wrapped and packaged long bits of pine, which are gonna be about 35 mil by 90 mil in this case, absolutely perfect for a huge amount of construction. You can mill them down into whatever size you happen to need them and build just about anything out of them. They won't be terribly pretty, they can be bent and twisted and you have to be a little bit picky of which ones you use, but bed slats are my biggest tip on free wood for the beginner to practice on because they're just so damn versatile. Of course, the other most common place of getting pine and sometimes some hardwood, if you're lucky, are pallets. Can't miss the opportunity to plug Dana Designs, the ex pallet punter, and if you go to his channel, much better than me because I don't use pallets that often, he'll show you what bloody grouse furniture you can make using wood which you can get from Bunnings, industrial areas, all over the shop people will beg you to take pallets off them because they're just expensive junk to dispose of. You do have to be just a little bit careful on selecting the wood, but again, check out Mark's channel and he'll go into all the finer details of how to avoid the nasty stuff and what you can do with the good stuff. Pallet wood, no shame in it, can be made into some pretty good furniture. And of course, your shop projects can't go wrong. When it comes to plywood, it can be harder to scab for free. But again, if you're patient, you look around and you jump quickly, I have not paid for a sheet of plywood in a very long time. Facebook Marketplace and Gumtree, again, you'll often find places that are just trying to dispose of randomly shaped offcuts. No, you're not gonna get full sheets, generally speaking, and it'd be the thinner, often construction type material, but sometimes on the side of the road, you'll see some plywood that's randomly being thrown out. If it's not been too wet, pick it up, and you'll be able to use it for these cabinets, cost me basically nothing. When it comes to scabbing MDF, I don't tend to too often. Having said that, the bench top of my miter station is this melamine coated MDF because I wasn't too worried about the underside top that I like. The big problem is, as you may be able to see here, MDF that spent any time outside is basically gonna be rubbish. Slightest bit of moisture is gonna bugger it up and it's so damn cheap you might as well just get the real stuff from the store. So scabbing MDF is not something I would usually do, but you can see it sometimes in old counter kitchen tops, which is what this is, and you can use that to your advantage too. Exactly the same applies to melamine. I generally don't use it too much to begin with, and it's just not worth, I think, these old drawers and knockdown furniture. They were cheap to begin with, they get old, they break down, moisture gets into them. If you want melamine, I'd probably recommend going and buying it, but if you happen to see something that's a nice, clean, big sheet of an old tabletop, or just is an old tabletop, this desk here I use as a workbench. It is chipboard melamine. It was dumped at the front of my place, and I got two of them, but absolutely nothing. And it's a portable workbench now that costs me zero dollars. So you can score some good stuff with the melamine too. The last thing I'll say about plywood, though I've not tried this trick myself, because quite frankly I've been too lazy and haven't needed to, is others have mentioned cabinet makers. Now, they're gonna get large sheets of good product, which will usually have what's called a cover board on them of stuff like this. Cheap, finished, rubbish plywood, which they're gonna chuck out and may well give to you for free. On top of that, you're also gonna have a lot of offcuts, which may be not free, but you'll get some good quality plywood material for a bargain price by raiding their bins. Have a Google for kitchen makers and cabinet makers in your area and you might be able to build a relationship with someone to help supply you with offcuts, which might be big enough for your needs. And now the one you've probably most been waiting for is hardwood, because they are so darn expensive, getting your hands on them for next to nothing or nothing at all is very desirable. Forever, the council collections, again, are my favorite. They're scheduled, so sometimes when you're driving around, you might notice a few people have put stuff out, yeah, it's a good time to be sticky beaking a little bit to see what's being turfed. Tabletops, old bed frames, pick them up. Generally, if you can feel the weight in them and they're not wet, then there's a good chance that is some decent hardwood. 
Other things, this here is spotted gum. It weighs a ton and it's just a scrap of flooring that one of my mates gave to me because he'd done his shop and he had some bits left over. Volunteer to destroy things. Not only is it fun, but you can usually salvage some good material as well. I have done a number of projects where it involved tearing things down before I had to reinstall with new materials. This here is some Mervo, which came from my parents' veranda. They were the slats holding up the handrails. These were also the exact same slats, but for some reason they were Moranti, and I made the Oz Geomaster logo by edge jointing these all together. However, if I did this again, I'd be using a project panel. We had some construction work done here at the building and they ripped out a whole bunch of western red cedar. I don't think that's actually a hardwood, it's a softwood. Good example here though is you've got to start to weigh up is it worth your effort. By the time I get the paint off here and the sanding, the milling, the machining, I've kept it for now, I might find a use for it. Don't clog up your store with too much stuff like this because it's just going to sit in the too hard basket and you're never going to end up chucking it out and it's just taking up space. So. Do be selective. Don't have to pick up everything you see on the side of the road, and your partner will probably thank you for that as well. The last thing I've got here is another offcut from Gumfire, the art project I did for Creative Relief a few months ago during the bushfires, and this is some River Red Gum, I think. There was obviously no label on it, and it was over 100 years old. It came from my pop's shed. Sadly, we lost him a few years ago, but when I went through his very, very many sheds on his property, I found a truckload of unidentified Australian hardwoods of various species and I've now got a pile of it to work through. I'm not going to have to buy wood, I am going to have to mill wood and that's the big thing with recycled timber. You're going to be trading cost for time and wear and tear on your tools. All right, that'll wrap it up for this week, guys. I hope you did enjoy these little free tight ass tips and I'll catch you on my next Fix It Fingers Fiber accessories. They're not tools per se, they're more things that are gonna help you use your tools when you're building stuff in your workshop. I'll see you then, catch you next time.